thank you for joining us today at Discovery Park of America. I'm Katie Jarvis from Discovery Park of America here in Union City, Tennessee. I will be your host for this and other lessons with professors from the University of Tennessee at Martin. These lessons are for students in grades six through nine, but they will be of interest to anyone. Today, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Michael Gibson, a professor of geology at UT Martin. He will be giving us a lesson today on the Tennessee State Fossil. Dr. Gibson, thank you so much for taking time to teach us about the Tennessee State Fossil. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you. Awesome. Well, we'll just, I'll just start off with one question right quick. Um, why are fossils important to study? Well, most people are used to seeing animals and plants everywhere they go, and we kind of take them for granted. But they probably don't realize, though, that with the age of the Earth, fossils are our only record of what has been here prior to humans. Uh, one of these interesting tidbit facts is over 99.9% .9 of all of life that has ever been on Earth is now extinct, wow. meaning they're gone. And by the way, that's considered a conservative estimate just based upon what we can find in the fossil record. And that makes the fossil record important because it is our only direct connection to that past life. Wow. All right, well, what are we gonna, what are we gonna be studying today? Well, um, today I thought I would give uh, everybody a, a little overview of what a fossil is, uh, and what it is and what is not a fossil, and then a little bit about Tennessee's fossil riches, and then we'll focus on one particular site that the University of Tennessee at Martin is now running and does research and education, and that's our Coon Creek Science Center down in McNary County. Wonderful. So, um, just to define fossil for you, a lot of people don't know the definition. Uh, fossil actually comes from a Latin word, fossilis, which means to dig. So a few hundred years back, anything that anybody would dig out of the ground could be a brick, could be an arrowhead, uh, could be a piece of pottery, or it could have been a seashell or a tooth or a dinosaur bone. All of that would have been considered fossil. However, the word has changed. Now, fossil, the term fossil is restricted to just past life on Earth. So if you pick up a brick or something of that nature that you dig up, that's actually called an artifact now. And that's what archeologists study. Archeologists do that because they're looking at human culture. Now I'm a paleontologist, so my job is to study ancient life on the planet. And so fossils are a predominant line of evidence for everything that we pick up. And they can be found in many, many places. Tennessee in particular is known for its fossil riches. If you go to the Smithsonian Institution, you go to the Peabody Museum at Yale, or the American Museum of Natural History in New York, you'll see many Tennessee fossils on display as the example of that type of life or life for that time frame or within a particular environment. So we get researchers that come around all over the world to do their collecting here. And this has gone on since the earliest days of Tennessee. Some of the first fossils that were found were found in the late 1700s. So um, we've got a number of things. Uh, if I say fossil to somebody, uh, a lot of people would think about a dinosaur. That's what I was and thinking. I get this question a lot. Do we get dinosaurs in Tennessee? Is that what you were getting ready to ask? I was thinking. I'm thinking. And dinosaurs. so the answer is we do, but not many. And in a few minutes, I'm actually going to show you and the viewers, they will see the only hadrosaur jaw ever found in Tennessee. And uh, us, our, our students here at UT Martin were the ones that discovered it. We've not even published it yet, but you're gonna get a chance to look at it. Oh, but this is what most people think of. They think of something like shark's teeth. And we do have that type of organism in Tennessee. This is the, the giant megalodon. And recently there was a movie about them. So these could be six inch teeth. We did not have them here, but I'll be honest with you, we don't care about them. Because as cool as that is, he is only about 5 million years old. A lot of our fossils literally go back 700 million years. Wow. So an incredible length of time to deal with. We do find shark teeth in West Tennessee, just not that big. Uh, we have about 40 different species of shark uh, from our own site that we can find things out of. Wow. So, um, let me zero down time frame because we can't do all of those in 20 minutes and talk about our site uh, and what we are finding on this site. 
So the Coon Creek Science Center was built around Coon Creek, which is a small creek that eventually in, uh, empties into the Tennessee River. It's in the extreme northeast corner of McNary County. Uh, the nearest town is Enville or Milledgeville, which is really small, by the way. Our closest Walmart is 40 miles away. Wow. So we're, we're out in a remote area, which is where a lot of fossil sites are. But it turns out this is great because it means we've got plenty of undeveloped land to search for the fossils. And the Coon Creek Science Center has 240 acres in which we can prepare digs on. And that's what we're doing right now. Um, this site was originally found in the late 1800s. Uh, it has been worked by many of the famous people from the Smithsonian. Uh, in the 1980s, the Peak Palace Museum acquired the property and they built part of the current facility that's there. In April of this year, I'm very happy, the University of Tennessee Martin, we took over running the entire site. So uh, we are ramping up and building and constructing uh, as we speak. And I'll be leaving shortly to go down and do some of that work. But as you mentioned before, one important aspect of this site is its age. It is about 70 million years old. Now, that means that if you were here then and you were in Nashville, you would have seen dinosaurs walking around outside. Wow. Uh, now, if you came west towards us though, by the time you would have gotten to the Tennessee River, you would have had to put on goggles and flippers because all of West Tennessee was ocean during that time frame. So our fossils in West Tennessee are gonna be marine, uh, which is pretty exciting. Now, this ocean, by the way, is, uh, if you think, we are in West Tennessee with elevations of four, five, 600 feet above sea level. So for us to have an ocean, sea level had to go up at least that much, if not a few hundred feet more, because you have to have room for animals to swim, okay? So this is an example of extreme sea level rise. As a matter of fact, if you were in West Tennessee at that time, you would have been watching ocean all the way to Colorado, and the Gulf of Mexico, you could have swam from there straight through the U.S. all the way to the Arctic Ocean. Wow. North America was actually two land masses with an ocean in between. And that is the setting for our Coon Creek fossils. And so here on one of our display signs, you see an organism called a mosasaur. So think about a mosasaur as a lizard with flippers, 20 to 30 feet long. We have at least five specimens that came off of our little 240 acres wow. uh, itself. And we're about to excavate some more. And Dr. Uh, another thing. I yes. do have a question or a comment. I believe we have a mosasaur. Is that, is that the correct word? That is correct. Mosasaur. I believe we've got a replica um, here at Discovery Park. In you our actually have two. You oh. have a, a full replica. And then you actually have the specimen that my students and I excavated in Kansas Yay. when the museum was getting ready to open. And that's the actual real skeleton that you've got there. And you're the only place in the country that has that specimen. And that's, is, isn't her name Kimberly? Uh, named after the wife uh, of one of our students. Oh, that I love great. it. That's, that's right. so neat. And, uh, and, we, and this is the main thing about what we do there. We involve our students in just about all of our work. Mm -hmm. Well, this site not only has these big, really impressive vertebrates, but what it's really known for is invertebrates. So this will be shellfish. Now, I'm sure all the viewers will recognize an oyster, if I show you an oyster, and you're used to cracking these open and eating. I like oysters. I don't know if you do. I love oysters. <laughs> this is a Coon Creek oyster. Wow, that is huge. Yep, it is. If I turn that around and show you size difference, Wow. That, it's the size of a steak. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, oh, you would only really need one. You wouldn't need a dozen. You only need one yeah. if you were here during Cretaceous time. Some of your viewers probably like to eat snail. That's a delicacy. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you know what that's called when you eat snail? Do you oh, know the word? Oh. Escargot. Mean, escargot. I knew it. I knew it. We had escargot here in West Tennessee wow. 72 million years ago. Same organism. Wow. Absolutely. Lots of self -made. So what is your favorite seafood? Let me ask you. Me, personally, I like shrimp. Shrimp. Hold the phone. <laughs> this is a box of maybe parts of about five shrimp. And so what I'm going to show you here, you should be able to recognize that's a claw off of a shrimp. Oh, uh-huh. I see it. And if I hold this one up, 
You might be able to see the claw, the tip of the claw right here on the end, but this curl around the back, that's uh -huh. the body of the shrimp. So you would normally have grabbed the shrimp and peeled them off and pulled the meat out to eat. Right. We had shrimp here in West Tennessee. I like shrimp too, but I gotta tell you, I like crabs better. Oh my goodness, look at that. So, exactly, we are known for excellent preservation. That makes this site what's referred to as a Lagerstätte in German, which means mother load. What? Yeah. Our site literally has over 700 species of fossil so is that it, span every group. Is it the soil that preserves it so well? How come, you know, it's a, it's a unique mixture of the type of sediment, how fast the sediment came in. So decay didn't take place and things got buried quickly. And we never built a mountain range here like the Appalachians or the Rockies. So we didn't beat up and destroy them. So we were in the Goldilocks of preservation. As a matter of fact, the preservation is so good on some of the specimens that can you see the shine on this when I turn it to light? So this is our state fossil. And that shine on the inside is, is called mother of pearl. I've heard so of that. So the ladies in the audience, when you get your wedding dress, you don't get plastic buttons. Right. You want punch shell, that's the high end. We still have the mother of pearl left in our 70 million year old specimens. Wow, that's incredible, the preservation. It is, it's, it, yes, it's, and, it's, and we've got probably the best preservation anywhere in North America for this. Mm -hmm. So that specimen, and here's another view, same animal, in 1988, 89, we lobbied the legislature of Tennessee for a state fossil symbol for Tennessee. And this was a Martin, endeavor. Uh, Martin had already produced one state symbol, limestone. So we were looking for our town to make the second one. And we looked at 10 different fossils around the state. Uh, we worked with teachers across the state and they voted on the one they wanted to be their official symbol. And it turned out is this fellow here. This is what's called a trigonid clam. They're almost extinct in the world today. There's only one region where you can find any of the relatives, and that's near the Philippines. Oh. They used to be worldwide, but they've gone extinct. Well, you can collect your own and have one. This is one of those rare um, state symbols that's an organism where you're allowed to keep one because, you know, raccoon is our state mammal, but you can't, you're not supposed to go right. ca catch one, right? right? You, if you find one of these at Coon Creek, we're going to let you have it. Now, it goes by a really gigantic name. It's Pterotrigonia scabrotrigonia thoracica. Wow. A huge Latinized name. <laughs> so we have uh, basically shortened that, and we call him Taro. That's much easier, Taro. Much easier. It's spelled with a P, and the reason is, if I rotate this this way, it almost looks like one side of an angel's wing. Yeah. Okay, and the word Taro means wing. So it has to do with its wing shape. You know what I'm and thinking that, of? What, pterodactyl. Well, and that's exactly what that they were winged, and that's where that comes from. Well, see, you just illustrated, this is one of the things we like to do at Coon Creek. We can not only teach you about fossils, but we can teach you foreign language, such as German and Latin, such as I've already done. We can also do geometry. Uh, we actually work on the angles for the triangles in here, and we can teach etymology in uh, English and art. Uh, using our site. Wow. So our fossils, they do give us the past, but not only that, they are, they become a an instrument for us to teach almost all other aspects of the sciences for sure, but even of the arts and things of that nature. So let me, if I can, I'm going to get back to another thing. We're really excited. Uh, would you hand me the rock that's in there? We're really excited about our most recent two finds. So one find is that one find is uh, our, our viewers probably are familiar with the Loch Ness Monster. Yes. Right? Big, long neck. That's an animal called a plesiosaur. Plesiosaur. Now, a plesiosaur. Now, they, the, the Loch Ness Monster is fabricated, right? That's, that's just a, a legend. However, plesiosaurs lived, and they lived in Tennessee. I found this about 15 years ago. This is one bone off the swimming paddle of a plesiosaur, which told us we should find them. Uh, and finding bone is fun. This is really great. We now got about five that we have found, but our real cool find we're so excited with is a rock. A rock? 
just a rounded, smooth looking rock. Huh. But this rock is found with no other rocks around it on our site. There's nothing literally in that sediment for hundreds of miles. So the question is, how did it get there? Mm -hmm. Plesiosaurs are kind of like birds. And the way birds help their digestion is they literally will swallow pebbles. Yeah. Well, if you're 30 feet long, that's a, pa a small pebble for wow. you, right? So this is what is called a gastrolith, which means stomach stone. And they would swallow them and they would use them to help their digestion. This is the first one ever found in Tennessee. Wow. It's actually the first one ever found in the entire Southeast. And we're hoping if we've got one and that animal died, there should be a lot more. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the fun parts. I excavate, my students excavate, but since we've taken over the site, we're gonna open up that site so that our viewers, if they want, can reserve, come down, we will train you on digging and let you work a little area to see if you can help find our Mosasaur parts for that us. Is so, so in other words, people participate in the science as citizen science. Oh, that's so neat. So when can somebody come down there? Do they have to make a reservation? Do they have to call or? Yes, so um, we, uh, we're in the process of revamping the site. Uh, so you can't just drive in off the street. You do have to call and make a reservation. We can give you that information shortly. Um, and then there will be a training program. Most of the site right now is in refurbish and research mode. Mm -hmm. So we're doing limited education and probably until spring. Uh, the other reason is that requires close contact. Right. And of course we have to deal with the COVID-19 issue uh, right. right now. So we're, we're hoping that by spring, we can have this open so that if just John Q public wants to come in, they'll call and reserve a spot. Uh, and then we'll, again, we'll train them, let them get on their hands and knees and collect. So the other beautiful part about that is the specimens they collect, if it goes to one of our research specimens, obviously we'll ask them to donate and we'll keep. But all the other shell material they find, oh, they can have it. You can just walk away with it and it's your very own. Oh, oh that's so neat. It is. And here's the best part about that. We can guarantee good Christmas presents even because once you carve, we will teach you how to take the specimen and fix it up like that. This is about an hour's worth of work yeah. and harden it. So you can give these away as your Christmas presents and it would be the most unique present anybody will ever have gotten. Absolutely. It was, you found it, it had been hiding from everybody for 70 million years. You find it, you collected it, you process it, and we'll teach you everything you need to know about this organism so that you'll also get the education lesson that goes along with it. So when, so say I wanted to come down there, I've made my reservation and I want to go out there, I've been through the training. How do I know where to dig? Do I just we go out in the water or, okay. Uh, it's a, right now it just looks like a landscape. It looks like a little floodplain out in the woods. Okay. Uh, we dig trenches up so that we can bring up material for little kids so that they don't have to worry about getting inside of a big dig. Gotcha. Uh, adults, we will put into the pit with us and literally you're on the, on the ground. Uh, we also have the creek itself where we dig larger specimens out of it. Again, we're working on a plesiosaur and parts of two mosasaurs uh, right now, plus all the shellfish that we've got, the crabs. And we actually, I didn't show you the lobster, but that's one claw off of a lobster. Oh my. That's a six inch claw. Is it at the bottom? Is that the claw right there? Uh, it's both. It's got the bottom oh, and the top. I see it now. Uh, so if you go to Red Lobster and crack one of these open, ours are twice as big as theirs. I was about to say, those are some big lobsters back there. They then. are. <laughs> but, but the meat is not quite as fresh as it is uh, right. there. Right. So uh, absolutely. Uh, 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 school groups in particular uh, are, are, are available to come in. And we we do all our, all our lessons geared towards the Tennessee Science Standards and National Standards. Uh, we have teacher docents. Um, what we can also do is we're having a volunteer program we've set up where if we've got somebody that just wants to participate and help us do our work, uh, we will give them a schedule when they can come on the site. We'll train them, we give them a nice good t-shirt to wear, and they will do some of the background work for us. Uh, and that could be digging, it could be processing, all the way up to museum curation of specimens uh, that are in there. So we're, we're, we're um, expanding the citizen scientist part of this uh, tremendously. What we want everybody to participate. Yeah, what a neat opportunity. And you might have said this, I just thought of a question. I know we talked about how it was ocean at one right. point. So would it be considered, right now the site, is that considered salt water or fresh water? 
So again, the site today is just land, right? But if we were back here then, that was absolutely salt water. It was marine and it was extremely tropical. It would have been like you being in the Bahamas. Whoa. The only difference is we didn't have coral reefs. We have coral, we didn't have big reefs because we had too much mud and sand coming in. Of course, that's what's great for the preservation. But the temperature during this time frame was basically the average would have been in the high 70s to low 80s year round. Uh, and there was actually more oxygen in the atmosphere. You would have breathed heavier, faster uh, during that time frame also. Oh, well, thank uh, you. It's an interesting time. Yeah. Um, one other thing, I know that we have several fossils on display here at Discovery Park. I've seen our Tennessee State fossil um, out on the in the Natural History Gallery. Did you help um, get those together? What was your part in helping Discovery Park get its collection? Um, when the Discovery Park, uh, when, when Robert Kirkland uh, started the process of doing that, uh, he placed me in charge of the natural history part, uh, me and Dr. Lionel Cruz, who's our astronomer here. And so the two of us pretty well worked with the design company to lay out and obtain the exhibit. So the layout of uh, the design company mostly did uh, based upon suggestions we gave, but pretty much every specimen that's on that natural history hall uh, are, are materials that either we have donated um, uh, from UT Martin or I have gone out to excavate on behalf of DPA, or we commission them to have been made, like your big dinosaurs, uh, only one, you actually don't have a, a, a real one, you've got all casts. Mm -hmm. And we commissioned those based upon specimens I knew around the country. Uh, so that was, uh, it started out at about $2 million to do wow. that. Wow, wow. So, well, it's and an my, my first almost heart attack, I think, <laughs> was a buying trip to Tucson where we were looking at the three biggest dinosaurs you've got and we commissioned 740 million dollars in 20 seconds so basically I spent seven I mean I spent uh, seven hundred thousand dollars in about 20 seconds wow which is rather hard exciting yeah. a little sweaty Woo. <laughs> yes fortunately I was really happy Robert was very happy with what oh, we yeah. got and so. we're just so we're excited that it's here and it's just an impressive gallery i mean that's one of the first things that guests experience when they visit discovery park is when they walk out and they see those dinosaurs i remember my first time visiting discovery park i thought i'm walking into night at the museum and these dinosaurs are going to come alive at nighttime <laughs> so it's just really neat i have one more yeah. question because i love the story of kimberly will you tell us um how y'all found it. You said it was in Kansas. Were y'all right. just digging around and then someone said, oh, I found it. Like kind of tell us that story real quick. Pretty much. Um, we had obtained most of the specimens from the museum at the time. And uh, we talked to Robert about having not reproductions of the big dinosaur things, but it'd be nice if we actually had uh, real specimens. It was the opportunity to literally film the process of collecting. So uh, there is a video that I think y'all still show. Yes. So we work with Tribal Company, which does excavations and, and, and uh, what they do is find a lot of these things. And we worked it out with them that uh, they sponsored and we went on an expedition to one of their dig sites near Dighton, Kansas. Now this was ocean seafloor. So it's in the middle of the sea. That's the same sea for our Coon Creek. It's just out way out in the ocean. Uh, we spent a week uh, with the students. Uh, hiking up and down arroyos, and it's a very desert-like setting to find specimens. And then when we found them, we literally began the excavations, which would take days of, of clearing and moving, casting them to be able to transport them. Then we they took them back to Denver, uh, uh, or actually Tribal's area uh, in Colorado, where uh, they opened the jacket. Then my students flew back out to the lab uh, later in the spring and they were taught the lab process parts of everything. And so then we, at that point, picked the actual specimen we wanted. Of course, Kimberly had to be in there because that one had a, you know, a, a personal relationship with one of our students in here. And, and I know he comes in periodically to do little tabletop shows where he gets to talk about his experience. And, yeah. and he tells me that this was one of the highlights of his, oh, his, his career up to that point. So, oh, uh, and we tried to do that with all our students. So Jack, come on in, Jack, why don't you take that off? Uh, I just, he's, this is one of our interns, uh, interns for you and for Coon Creek. Uh, he's an example, one of the students that we involve in this research now. He and I'll be leaving shortly uh, to go down to the site to actually do some of this work. Oh, uh, wonderful. 
That's awesome. And I just have, I have another question because I'm a big Jurassic Absolutely. Park fan. <laughs> so, you know, I, I remember them going and, you know, dusting the bones off and everything, and then they get the DNA. Is that possible? Um, actually, it is possible. Um, we don't get it with uh, dinosaur DNA. The older it is, the less likely it is to get DNA. But one of the other research projects that we've got going on here at UT Martin in Gleason, just a little bit to the east of us, are clay pits. And they contain fossils as well. They're, they're only, only 30 million years old. Okay. okay? Not the 70s, they're half as old. But the fossil leaves in them still have DNA. Wow. So some of the research I'm working with was, uh, was with Penn, uh, Penn State University, where we are trying to extract the DNA out of the fossil leaves. And we can, we have found DNA. Wow. So this is old DNA, but the problem is, we can't do like they did in the movie, which is amplify it up to get a full complement. We get little snippets, and it also has what's called environmental DNA, which is not DNA from one organism, it's everything that floated in, it's a contaminant. But it, it, we are hopeful that if we get the right materials, we might be able to isolate really good DNA, uh, full strands, so we can identify an organism. We just know that, yes, it does preserve. That is so neat, that is so neat. Well, Dr. Gibson, thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Jack, for, I know his, for assisting him and for participating in this. Is there anything else you want to say before we close it up? Uh, yeah, I just want to give everybody the contact information. If you're interested in coming down to Coon Creek, uh, well, you can uh, call us. Uh, we run this program through the Selmer, UT Selmer Center. And the phone number is 731-646-1636. Um, or if you're in McNary County, Hardin County, they can drop into the Summer Center and talk to the folks there. We do have a small display, museum display at the Summer Center that contains some of our materials as well. Yeah. And we look forward to hearing. Um, they can also send me uh, an email message uh, and we'll be happy to see what we can do about scheduling uh, time for groups at this point. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Gibson. And you're very welcome and thank you. Absolutely. And thank you to our viewers today for joining us. We look forward to continuing our mission of inspiring children and adults to see beyond. For more educational resources, visit our website at discoveryparkofamerica.com slash education. See you later.